Hi, I'm so glad you're here because today we're learning all about polymerization reactions in organic chemistry. Specifically, we're going to be looking at radical, cationic, anionic, and condensation polymerization. We'll explore their mechanisms and their significance in polymer science. And stay tuned to the end because I have some practice problems that should help you on your next exam. In a previous video, we learned all about polymerization in organic chemistry where individual monomers can combine to form long chains of repeating units which we call polymers. The first type of polymerization reaction we're going to talk about is radical polymerization. The first step in this mechanism is what is called initiation where you can do things like add heat to a peroxide to generate two brand new radical species, which can then react with our starting material monomer. Once we've generated this radical species, it can react with the starting material monomer to form a brand new radical carbon. This initial initiation step is integral to the formation of radical polymerization because we have to initiate this process through this carbon radical. Again, this process is called initiation. And this step is incredibly important. And in fact, you're going to see that in most of the mechanisms, initiation is the very first step in polymerization reactions. Once this carbon radical has been formed, we can undergo subsequent radical reactions to regenerate brand new radical species. And this step is known as propagation where you are continuously adding on monomers that all have a carbon radical which can further react with additional starting material to allow us to generate brand new radical carbons throughout this process that allow us to elongate those polymer chains by adding additional carbon radicals. Once propagation has been allowed to occur over several steps to end up with our elongated polymer chain, the final step is what is called termination. So termination can actually proceed via two different pathways. So remember, first off, we generated two of these radical species from our peroxide. So one of the termination steps that can occur is that that other radical that we formed can actually conjoin with this carbon radical to finally form our final polymer, which would contain the ending group, which would be an OR group. Alternatively, what might actually occur is if we have two of our different polymer chains come into contact with one another, we could actually get a termination step where the two carbon radicals combine to form an even longer fully formed polymer chain. Next, let's talk about cationic polymerization. Similar to radical polymerization, this process and mechanism proceed via a similar pathway where you have initiation, propagation, and termination. However, importantly, the different monomers that are contained for cationic polymerization have to be able to stabilize a cation, as the name implies. Therefore, typically, the type of monomers that we use have an electron donating group on them. A common example of this might just be a simple methyl group, so propylene would proceed via a cationic polymerization. Additionally, we might have something like a methoxy group. And previously, we've learned about electron donating and electron withdrawing groups, so it'll be important to be able to identify what these groups are in order to discern whether or not the process is proceeding via something like a cationic polymerization. Another example might be an amine, which has that lone pair, which can act as an electron donating group. Let's break down the mechanism for cationic polymerization. The first step, again, is called initiation. However, in this instance, you are using a, an acid in order to generate a new cationic species. The pi electrons located in an alkene can deprotonate an acid, thus generating a new species which has a carbocation on the carbon position. This is why it was important that the R group be an electron donating group because we need to stabilize the carbocation that is formed in this mechanism. From here, propagation occurs by pi attack of these pi electrons to the carbocation species, allowing us to generate multiple monomer chains with which we are generating, regenerating the carbocation species, which can undergo subsequent polymerization. Similar to how the final step in radical polymerization was called the termination step, the same is true for cationic polymerization. And just like in that mechanism, there are two different pathways with which this can terminate. Remember that there was a generation of a conjugate base under the deprotonation of our initial acid that we used. Therefore, this means that there is a conjugate base still present in our solution, and there are alpha carbons, alpha to the carbocation, that can be deprotonated. 
And if this was to occur, what would happen is that these electrons would come down and regenerate an alkene species. Under these conditions, this would mean that your final chain or your final monomer addition of your polymer would in fact be a new alkene that is formed. Alternatively, additional nucleophiles can be added to your reaction mixture, which would simply attack the carbocation that's formed. This means that the termination step for this process would be slightly different where instead of just forming an alkene, you actually have a nucleophilic addition at that carbocation species. In addition to the inductive effect differences of the substituents on your monomer, the difference between cationic and anionic also results in the fact that you have a base for the anionic mechanism. This nucleophilic carbon species, like butyl lithium for example, will attack the alkene species Moving the pi electrons, this process generates a brand new monomer which can further react with additional species through this anionic mechanism. Through subsequent nucleophilic attack, regenerating brand new carb anion species, this is the propagation or the elongation of the polymer chain that is continuing to grow via subsequent nucleophilic attack on brand new monomers. So again, these carbanions can continue to react and generate our polymeric species until we finally get to a point where we can undergo the final termination step. The polymerization process is terminated when an external electrophile is added to the system. An example of this might be a weak acid like water, for example, which can be deprotonated to generate a final polymer, which is just protonated at that position. Additionally, if you add an electrophile, like CO2 for example, then this would attack the carbon electrophile and allowing us to generate a new terminal carboxylic acid where you have now added a CO minus, which can subsequently be protonated at that position to end up with our terminal carboxylic acid. As we've seen previously, the term condensation is used to characterize any reaction in which two molecules undergo an addition accompanied by the loss of a small molecule like water, carbon dioxide, or even nitrogen gas. As an example, consider the formation of polyethylene terephthalate, also known as PET, which is used to make soft drink bottles. As shown, PET is prepared by successive Fischer esterification reactions. Since the polymer is generated via condensation condensation reactions, we call this a condensation polymer. Now let's try some practice problems. Pause the video, try these problems independently, and then resume the video to check my solutions. When distinguishing between cationic polymerization and anionic polymerization, it's helpful to identify the substituents that are contained on the different monomers. And in this case, I see that they are all aldehydes. This means that I might expect that two of the monomers would be two different aldehydes, which have reacted for example, that look exactly like this. Importantly, both of these are electron withdrawing groups, which leads me to believe this is likely to be an anionic polymerization. In fact, the mechanism for this would be through the addition of something like a butyl lithium, which can attack at the pi location on the terminal alkene, generating our brand new carbanion species, which would have our added butyl group, leaving behind a carbanion, which can undergo further attack at the new pi electrons of our other monomers. The first step in determining which monomers were used to generate this specific polymer formation, it's easiest to identify what functional groups are repeating. And in this case, I see that there are repeating esters throughout this molecule. Previously, we have learned about esterification reactions that can occur anytime you have a carboxylic acid that reacts with something like an acid. So for example, if this molecule were to react with a carboxylic acid, we could form an ester. This is called Fischer esterification, which we have learned about previously in this course. From there, we can identify that there are several different repeating units with which we might use as our individual monomers in this reaction. For example, if we were to take a dicarboxylic acid that looks like this, and react it with some sort of alcohol that looks like the rest of our species, then we might see the individual monomers that could have reacted and undergone Fischer esterification to generate our polymer species. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my channel and drop a comment down below if you have any questions about polymerization or anything else related to chemistry. Until next time, I'll see you in the next video.